In March 2022, Architecture's most prestigious award was handed to Burkina Faso-born architect Diabeto Francis Carré. He's behind the design of this complex, situated an hour outside of Burkina Faso's capital, Ouagadougou. Sa particularité, c'est que, pour dire simplement, il part du matériau le plus simple, mais lui, il en a fait quelque chose de noble. C'est-à-dire, c'est la terre, c'est tout ce qu'il y a autour de nous. Quand il les rassemble, il fait vivre quelque chose qui est assez magnifique. The complex encompasses a school, a health center, workshops, guest houses, and eventually an opera house. The buildings use local materials such as clay, laterite, granite, and wood. And they are designed to withstand the extreme heat of the region. In the buildings that we have, you will see that without the support of electricity, the circulation just of the air du fait de l'orientation des bâtiments, du fait du choix des matériaux et d'autres techniques qu'il a utilisées avec les différents niveaux de plafond et de toiture. In a world with increasingly extreme weather, building with climate change in mind has never been more important. But finding ways to build that don't contribute to making global warming worse is even more crucial. The world's population is expected to reach nearly 10 billion by 2050. Countries are going to need to build new houses, millions of them, and they are going to need them fast. The UN estimates that three quarters of the infrastructure the world will need by 2050 has yet to be built. And most of our modern cities have been built out of primarily one material, concrete. It's in our homes, our roads, our bridges. It's the second most used material in the world after water. Concrete's key component is cement, and the process of making it is incredibly polluting. Cement production is, um, is polluting in terms of its CO2 emissions. They mainly come from the production of clinker, so the heating up of what's called the raw meal, so this mixture of limestone and clay, up to very high temperatures, so 1,450 degrees Celsius. Um, so it's the energy that's required to heat the, temp the, heat the material up to that temperature, which is important, but also it is the calcination of limestone. So there's a chemical reaction which occurs. Limestone gets decomposed to calcium oxide plus CO2. And that's an intrinsic part of the clinker and cement making process, which can't be avoided. If the cement industry were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of CO2 on Earth, behind only China and the United States. Cement production alone accounts for as much as 7% of global CO2 emissions, three times those produced by aviation. This massive carbon footprint and a need to climate-proof buildings have led to a race to find suitable alternatives and a resurgence in a turn to traditional materials. Une BTC, c'est une brique de terre comprimée. Amhari Karia van Tahad Kain ko bishewaze bina avakran. Shlefto is a, a, a wood town, a wood city, a wood, wood community. Concrete's origins can be traced back as far as ancient Greece and Rome, and it owes its popularity to several things. It's strong durable, versatile, requires little maintenance, and it's relatively cheap. In countries like China, India or Nigeria, with large or fast-growing populations, tons of concrete are poured every day. If global warming is to be kept at bay, experts say low-carbon building approaches must take hold in these emerging nations, since they will account for much of the world's concrete needs going forward. But current trends are not pointing in a good direction for the planet. Recent data shows that over the last two decades, emissions from the cement industry have more than doubled, mainly driven by a sharp increase in production in China. The Global Cement and Concrete Association, which represents manufacturers that account for around 40% of global output, says its members are committed to carbon-neutral concrete by 2050. 
but getting there might be easier said than done. A big part of the industry's CO2 emissions cannot be avoided. We recognise it has a CO2 challenge, which is why the industry has come together and commit to a net zero um, concrete by 2050 with real milestones to 2030. And they're delivering against that and they've been acting on this for over a decade and we've been reporting on it for over a decade. If there was a silver bullet to decarbonise our industry, we would follow that. Um, there isn't a silver bullet, but there's many actions we can take down the value chain to decarbonise our sector. The group's 2050 roadmap is relying heavily on capturing the CO2 emitted in cement factories. The technology exists, but has yet to be deployed on any meaningful scale. Green cement alternatives are slowly appearing, but have not yet been adopted by traditional manufacturers who say it will take them time to adapt. So given its massive carbon footprint and the difficulty to decarbonise the industry, shouldn't we be abandoning concrete altogether? If there's a magic material that comes from somewhere else that can be delivering the same performance, that can deliver the same scale and is available everywhere, well then that material will actually win out in the years to come. But at the moment, there is no available material. Um, the volumes required and the performance required to deliver clean water, bridges, energy, clean energy, renewable energy relies on concrete infrastructure, homes that are reliable um, and, uh, and long lasting, um, then we'll, we've got concrete. And the good news is we're on a path to decarbonize that, which complies with Paris and the 1.5 degree scenario. A recent research paper suggested mid-rise timber buildings could be an alternative to concrete and steel, potentially saving more than 100 billion tonnes of carbon emissions while still preserving enough cropland to feed a booming population. Wooden buildings have twofold advantages. A lot of CO2 has been sucked out of the atmosphere by these standing forests. So our idea is to then make buildings out of it and store carbon in a, for a long term in those buildings. So, at, so the one advantage is that you're storing carbon for a long time, but uh, at the same time, you're not emitting uh, emissions which you would have emitted by production of cement and steel. The Swedish town is home to one of the world's tallest wood buildings and is pushing for more timber in construction. Having this project being built, it showcases that you, it, it is possible to build this tall and complex in timber. And when you, when you have this as a backdrop to, of, of discussions, you can always say that, but we did this, uh, so how can you say it's not possible? And while wood could be a theoretical alternative to concrete, the reality is all materials come with their own issues. Abandoning cement is very, it's a very extreme um, suggestion and, you know, we can just look around us to see that we use so much cement. It's not the case that if we were to substitute concrete for another material like steel or like timber, that these environmental impacts would go away. They would still exist. Um, they may be slightly reduced in some areas, but in some other areas they, they may increase. So for example, timber, um, you know, we need to ensure that the forestry was conducted in a sustainable manner. In a world where human-made materials now outweigh Earth's entire living biomass, finding a sustainable way forward is a colossal challenge. For me, to say that we stop to construct is like if we say we stop to feed ourselves. The question is not the population growing, not that we have to stop to eat, it's how we se nourrit, comment on se loge et comment on construit, comment changer nos modes de consommation et euh, travailler sur des modes de construction plus durables euh, dans, une, euh, dans une réflexion écosystémique euh, basée sur une économie circulaire, donc changer aussi nos modes d'économie, euh, nos systèmes de valeur pour que euh, l'impact de nos constructions euh, devienne plus durable.